Okay. All right, messing with a few controls. Now we're good. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending the 2016 Base Fatality List Summary. Uh, we're trying to review over everything. Here's what we're going to look at. We're basically going to cover some of the incidences that happened in 2016, and uh, hopefully we can learn from some of the mistakes and also have an opportunity to talk about it. Yeah. Talk about some of the incidences and uh, give uh, more people a chance to chime in and maybe even ask questions about some of these specific incidents. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mick Knudsen. I have been running, me and Pato have been running the base fatality list since 2007 when we took it over from Louder. Hey, when we took it over from, give me one second then. I guess I will work on the volume right now. Right, give me one second. Okay. Dynamics. Output. How about now? How about now for volume? Uh, is this volume better? Josh, is this volume better for everyone, for you? Hopefully it is. I got this over here. Okay. So talking about some of the specific incidences, going over some of the uh, some of the stats first. I want to go over statistics, and then we're going to go over the specific incidences. So let's actually cover. I'm going to go to a little bit of PowerPoint, just a presentation to talk about a few things, just to see uh, better graphs here. So 2016 stats, um, first of all, I want to make sure everybody really knows a little bit about the base fatality list, um, so you know the context in which we're coming from. The context of the base fatality list is to gather incident information, facts about what happened for individual incidents. We're not trying, uh, we're not trying to do anything but help learn from these incidences and learn from the mistakes. We're also trying to have a way to educate everyone about the things that are happening, also to see patterns in the incidences that we may be seeing so that we can try to circumvent these specific patterns. And of course, we're trying to remember and respect our fallen friends and make sure that we can learn something from this. Now, a few things to keep in mind here. Yeah, there we go. Kind of looking at this. Ooh, it's kind of uh, not too good, is it? Let's, uh, I'm trying to change the view of this real quick so I can see this a little bit better. Uh, I'm trying to get a view. Let's go up a little bit. Uh, not the way I want it. There we go. Ah, a little bit better. That that way at least everybody can see the stats, right? As we can look at here, we've been graphing the incidences since 1981. And as you can see in blue is anything that's not a tracking suit or a wing suit, some type of what we'll call slick clothing, jeans, something like that. Uh the the orange that you can see is a tracking type suit, whether it's a two piece or a one piece, and wing suits are in red. And as you can see, we've been steadily increasing, but last year we really had a big jump last year specifically. So try this again. There we go. That's still. Now, um, some of the things to keep in mind in 2016, we had 37 fatalities, and here's a breakdown of each of the fatalities per month. Specifically, I'd like to highlight that in June, which is approximately the start of our season, we had six. July was very low with two. And in August, we had 15 fatalities in that one month alone, and only three in September. Mostly, I believe, from a, a backlash of what happened in 
August or everybody being a little bit more, way more cautious and fearful of what happened. Now, seven of these fatalities were tracking suits and 27 were wing suits. Now, here is year versus year. 2015, as you can see, put that up. Um, in 2015, we did have a lot of wingsuit fatalities, way more than we had tracking suit or slick jumps. In 2016, we increased slicks uh, as well as tracking suits, and we did have a noticeable increase in wingsuit fatalities year over year. Now, I've been reaching out to other organizations, uh, most specifically the uh, Norwegian Base Association actually has been tracking uh, incidences and fatalities since 1994, I believe, is when they were tracking it. As you can see here, they track pretty well as far as what the problems are that they actually have. They actually had a decrease uh, from 2015 to 2016 with fatalities. I mean, with the incidences, but there was a slight increase in fatalities because there was also a single fatality there, which we will actually cover here in a minute. Now, you can also see this, the number of incidences versus fatalities. They have a pretty good and steady pace, and it is nice they, they track this. Now, the Swiss Base Association does not track the same type of information, so we're not able to do the same correlation as we are here, but it is uh, pretty nice to be able to quantify that. Now, we're going to go through several of these over in the next few, or the next time we have. We have a, at max, we have two hours, but I do think that's a little bit long. We're going to do two different sessions, and the first one here, we're going to cover a few of these uh, incidences. As you can see here, these are the list of incidences. One of three. We're going to start with Matthew Kenny in a minute, and then we go down further in um, into these incidences where we go through two hundred number two eighty eight through number three hundred, and then throughout two thousand sixteen we ended the year at BFL number three one two. Now, let's think about. Some of the things that happened, and this is what we're going to look at with the incidences as well. The leading cause of fatalities in 2016, 11 of them were in flight, and they were mostly slow, controlled flight into a terrain, eight of which, eight of these incidences were also issues with exit, whether they're unstable exits, wake turbulence, or something similar to that from the initial launch of the exit. And then five of them were, of these incidences were on deploy, and they were mostly low pulls or no pulls. And one of them, one of these no pulls, was specifically a gear malfunction. Uh, this was a rigging error, and uh, we have had lots of talks about that. We will actually talk about that here in just a minute as well. Now, before we start going into each individual of these uh, incidences, I do want to point out a thing that we need to keep in mind. I think some people tend to miss this, uh, especially newer jumpers miss this, at least that I see, is that you need to jump for yourself and not for somebody else. You ultimately have to be realistic about your abilities and your skill level. Um, you're the only person that can judge that. Somebody else is not going to be able to adequately judge your skills like you are. And you really should use, you should use caution when you're doing a first jump or a reconnaissance jump. There is absolutely no reason to jump a site or a line full throttle that you've never actually jumped. There is no reason why you can't do a reconnaissance jump. and Get to understand what the characteristics of this jump or this site or this line actually is. And then you can tailor that jump afterwards on the second or subsequent jumps. You don't have to do this on the first jump. We're going to point out several 
incidences where this was the case. People did not take caution and they went full throttle onto the jump and this cost them their life, unfortunately. And as you can see here, number five, do not expect anybody else to assess your abilities correctly. Just because somebody says to you, you're okay, you should be able to handle this, that is not your indication that you can do this. You need to go back up here to number one and say, and reread this to be, only you can actually assess that. Nobody else can assess this for you. And taking that bit of caution for yourself, I believe, will, will help you to be a little bit more cautious and, of course, hopefully stay safe. Now, go and let's mention some other things from here. Okay, so we're going to stop this. We're going to go try this. And we're going to go to one of the first incidences. We're going to cover several of these. Matthew McKinney, January 12th, 2016. This was in Arizona. This was a wingsuit flight. This was a three-way wingsuit jump. And the issue here, let me get rid of this heading here. Uh, basically, the, the issue was that this was the first time, uh, I believe, that he had been to this, that Matthew had been to this site, and he did not fly a, a cautious line. He flew uh, a line that he may be familiar with and may have been, go, lower third, there we go. He was, um, Flying like he would have flown something he knew very, very well when uh, he did not know where he was jumping. So, unfortunately, that was a, a problem for him. Again, not doing a reconnaissance jump. Reconnaissance jump would have, uh, would have helped this. Now, let's try to do this individually. Let's go to 277. Now, this is actually... Unfortunately, a really tragic incident. This is an incident, Katie Carell. Uh, this was on January 20th. This was a bridge in Big Sur, California, and she drowned along with one other person, which we're going to see next. Uh, she was a very low time jumper, take being taken to a jump that had a lot of weather conditions, uh, and of course, it was winter on. The Pacific Ocean, and of course, where when she made the jump, she was attempting to land on a very small piece of, of beach that would allow her to not get wet to cross a river. There's a small river uh, underneath this bridge. Now, by trying to not get wet, there was extra risk taken, and unfortunately, there was also no assumption or no real planning to do with a water landing or a potential water landing. There was a cutaway handle on this rig, which was still intact and uh, was not cut away. And there was no flotation device. And unfortunately, there was uh, basically it was a drowning. And. After that, we're doing, this is the first time in history we've actually ever done a second, kind of like a plan B, somebody who's not actually on, uh, was not directly a base fatality, but on the same day, uh, Rami was actually the one helping her do the jump, and he had PCA'd her, and he witnessed her going in the water and starting to have a problem. He actually jumped down, landed, took off his rig, jumped in to try to save her. But this is winter weather in the Pacific Ocean, and it was also not really uh, good conditions anyways. So there was big surf, and he also drowned, unfortunately. So this was kind of a dual uh, incident at the same time. And this was very tragic incident. One thing to, to keep in mind with this, again, you have to have a plan B. You have to also assess every specific 
problem that could occur. You don't want to jump just for, uh, or you don't want to plan your jump so everything goes right. You need to plan it in case something's going to go wrong, and that is your worst case scenario. A couple things that could have uh, could have helped this situation is again flotation device. If you know you're jumping and landing so close to the ocean and so close to water, then it could have that could have helped. Uh, also, really not being so stuck on jumping because you drove so far. Look, you can always jump at some other time in your life and drive home. There's nothing wrong with not making a jump. All right. Now the next one here. Hopefully everybody likes uh, the pace we're going here. So, Yuli Wombach. <clears throat> now, Yuli, this was on January 20th. Of course, this was actually in Italy. And this was off of a wingsuit. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, basically, there was a two-way uh, wingsuit solo, and, and Yuli was a solo. And then what happened is he was flying close to the landing area, and, of course, he initi initiated his opening. And what it looked like is that there was a problem with the actual pull itself. And he had lots of experience. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this is it looks like that that the pull itself was the problem, and he was in the position that he was having or he was pulling in gave him a problem with the pull, and of course, by using the line that he took, he did not give himself enough extra altitude for that extra pull. He waited. Till the very end, and by having that issue, there was no margin for error for him to actually be able to find that pull, find his BOC, and be able to deploy his parachute correctly. Again, unfortunately for this, this was not taking caution and also having a plan B. Yeah. Just Jump plan A, assume plan B, be prepared for plan C, and if you make it to plan D, that stands out. Don't give up. Absolutely. Mick, you've got Nate and Sam here, 11 in flight, slow flying, and clearing main problem. Reduce this, and it could be almost 33% of fatalities. We personally believe that the major part of wingsuits and specifically flying terrain has have speed. Yes, absolutely. Ultimately, we put a wingsuit regardless of the jump and in flight, higher chances of dying. It's not simple base jump, but flying, flyer flying their body, safe to landing. Absolutely, right? There, there's, there is an increased amount of risk because of the complexity of what you're trying to jump. That has to be taking, taken into account, right? Thank you very much. Now. 79. Patrick Kerber. Oh, there we go. Speed is our friend. Yes. Well, we've we've got a couple more incidences. We're talking about this as well. Patrick Kerber, March 13th, Earth. This is a uh, Titleist, and this is an impact. Of course, he had 2,000 jumps. 14 of them were wingsuit jumps. Initial police report states at the time the deceased jumps in bad weather in an area where lots of low-level fog and increased chance of low visibility. Well, yes, he was experienced, and he was also experienced at that object, but again, not only were we talking about uh, an issue with visibility, we were, we were having an issue potentially with complacency because they felt so comfortable. And with that extra fog actually changes the dynamics of how a parachute and or a wingsuit flies. So by us not taking that into account, we actually lose this margin of, uh, of, of safety we have and we lose that. Unfortunately, with this again, 
this caused I, I you know I believe uh, there was a degree of complacency because they felt they had so much experience with this. Right, go number two eight zero, Brandon Jackson. Now Brandon, Brandon was on March thirty first, and this was an antenna in Metcalf, Georgia. This was an uh, an impact, and he had over two hundred and fifty base jumps. This was a night jump, and of course, uh, what it appeared here is that. Of course, when we're jumping at night, everything is harder to actually to, to see and to view. We don't have enough uh, daylight to view things like guy wires. And I, this is what seems to have led to this incident. Poor lighting conditions, poor choice to actually also make a shallow delay. I also think that uh, this is another thing that happens to persons. They decide to climb a tower. Again, this is, a, this is a, an opinion here that it appears that it may have been uh, made a climb, got to the top, and for whatever reason, did not necessarily feel that he, you know, whatever, whatever the feelings might have been, he was slider up. He decided for whatever choice to make a lower. Uh, a slower delay, which of course is not helpful if you have an off heading opening. And of course, uh, from that, you're either going to impact guy wire, impact the antenna, and then of course, that is where your, your problems are going to compound. Especially to note, there are some others in history for this. Um, when we're jumping at night, we have to do the diligence to actually have reference to all of the obstacles and problems that we specifically have, or potential problems that we're going to have at that site. And okay, before we go to this, what do we have? That was the first, that was his first base night jump. Ah, Dominic, I did not know that. If this was, if this was his first night base jump, that is a significant factor because well, he was very unfamiliar with uh, viewing a terrain, that terrain at night. That is, a, that is a serious issue. Thank you, Dominic. appreciate that. Now, uh, number 281. Number 281 is Stefan Thevernez. Not sure how to pronounce that last name. Very apologetic about that. And... This issue, April 4th, this was in Les Evouettes, uh, Switzerland, and this was a line twist leading to a cliff strike in a wingsuit. Of course, uh, as you can see, we don't have a lot of, issue, uh, lot of uh, information about this. We actually have very little information about this, unfortunately, and this is one of the things I want to start bringing up. Uh, Please don't take it the wrong way. If we're, if me or Pat or somebody is trying to reach out to get information, we are trying to learn from this information. We're trying to learn from these mistakes and be able to bring them to light to other people or and to everyone. Now, in this situation, one thing that uh, would be easy uh, to to state is the number one rule: no matter what. When your canopy opens, it doesn't matter if there's line twist. You need to get away from the object. Getting, un, getting the line twist untwisted first is not the first priority. You have to turn the canopy away from the object. And if that means you need to take your arms and pull up above the line twist to actually make that turn, that is very, very important. And <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Uh, another issue is that, uh, again, because we don't know a lot of this information, we also have to consider that it could have been something where they attempted to use the brakes to make a turn away from the brake, away from the cliff, while we're in line twist. 
I, this might be obvious, but maybe not obvious to everyone, you should at no point ever decide to unstow your brakes and start using your brakes when you have line twists. You could actually have more problem in that incident. You need to get away from the cliff by pulling your risers that are above your, your line twist and then untwisting the line twist and then you can unstow your brakes. If that means you have to do a PLF landing because you're about to land, then do a PLF landing. And if you don't know how to do a PLF landing, then you really should go back skydiving and learn to do a PLF landing and practice them. Because again, this isn't something you should not know. This is part of plan B, plan C, and plan C, etc. Two eighty two here. All right. Roy Kenneth Rowland. Now, Roy Kenneth Rowland was on April twentieth. This was in high nose in Lauterbrunnen. This was a low pull. And this was in a power tracking suit. Now, he had a lot of experience with big wall tracking, sure, but it was also his fifth or sixth jump on this trip. And it was a three way off of high nose specifically. Now, the issue with this, it seems that <clears throat> that he started actually um, to, <coughs> excuse me, had a good exit, good steep. He was doing a good track, and he maybe was going for extra distance or trying to, uh, you know. Tr trying to get a little further, but one thing is clear. One of the other jumpers had mentioned he had had problems with his goggles. Thus, we, can we could possibly assume that created an issue with visibility. And when we're tracking, or doing wingsuits, visibility is important to actually have these key, the, the, the key visual factors of when you need to pull. You can't just assume that because you feel a certain amount of time has passed, you're going to have the same altitude as you did on some other jump. So instead of being cautious when there was, a, was noticeably a problem, which is visibility out of the goggles, he was going for a distance, uh, and of course that caused a low pull, and there was not time to actually initiate the correct pull. Always unzip, fix heading, kick out a line twist. Yes, kick out a line twist. Yes, but remember, uh, I'm trying to also jump back and forth with the uh, comments. The first thing before kicking out a line twist, you have to get away from the cliff. You have to find a way to climb up the risers. And there are plenty of great videos on YouTube showing people pulling themselves up, doing pull ups on their risers to be able to turn their canopy away, and then they are able to then get out of line twist second. 283. This is very, very unfortunate situation. I personally was on this specific incident. This was on May 13th. This was at the Brian Bridge. And this was a, essentially an impact uh, with a pilot chute hang up and some several other factors. There were actually lots and lots of factors, and I actually put the link in here, the URL here, because there are lots of issues here. One of there are a lot of contributing factors with this, and there were many uh, great people who were also watching this. So this was a high visibility situation, and I believe. In my opinion, one of the key factors that kicked the whole thing off was that fatigue, extreme fatigue, as well as dehydration from being uh, just just leaving a, the base event in Las Vegas, driving eight hours after that, and then getting to the bridge and deciding to do a jump, five jumps in a row 
really fast in one day is is too much. Right? We're not able to uh, experience any of this, uh, any of the jump. Where there's no debriefing, and I believe with the fact that she was already fatigued, she was she had to be dehydrated. The the key thing about those two things alone, dehydration and fatigue, the first thing to go physically in a human being is mechanical reasoning and being able to have mechanical aptitude, like packing or also dealing with incidences in a, uh, that we may have in a short period of time. This actually decreased her ability to, to deal with any given problem that she may have. Now, with this, five jumps in one day, packing really, really fast when she's a low time jumper, she specifically, and this was one of the facts here, she specifically had 35 jumps only when she arrived to the bridge. And she had five that day, and this was in the fifth one. So she was only on her 40th jump and essentially packing really fast. Um, you know, when I started, we didn't have the opportunity to jump so fast. So we, we ended up having to walk a lot. And, you know, we actually digested the jumps every single time we had a jump. And I think that's a lost art nowadays is having that, that reflective period to say what happened with the jump. And am I learning something for the jump or am I just cranking out numbers? Now, this was, again, an unfortunate accident. I believe this was uh, definitely fixable by taking a little bit of extra time to understand uh, what we're packing, be more comfortable with our packing, and just enjoying the jump a little more. Now, Fernando Brito, number 284. Unfortunately here, Fernando uh, was a Brazilian. This is in, uh, in Gave, Rio. And this is a bad exit due to high winds. And it was about five to six seconds from exit. And he was using a wingsuit, vampire. Now, what it, of course, appeared to is that um, there was gusty winds. And he still decided to make a jump with this wingsuit. And it seems that after he had made the jump approximately 200 meters below the exit point, uh, he was actually found and he had impacted. This could be a lot of things. There's no real, nobody who actually really ended up seeing this. Some of the things that could have been a problem is how he decided to launch, also the winds. But one of the big things that is super important about the wingsuits that we're using today is that they are enormous wingsuits. They have a lot of power. They can stall. They can also get us moving in the incorrect direction much faster than we may be able to correct in you know, the time that we're able to do. We're able to make that decision. So when we're actually taking other key factors, like if there's a, a, you know, a, a heavy wind, this suit may, on a bad exit, actually fly us into, into the object far quicker and far faster than we can actually decide to correct. And we have to, again, take that into consideration before we decide to make this jump. And again, yes, attain. A lot of these jumps are in bad weather. Another thing I would, you know, like to say, uh, I, you know, I actually don't think I've said this for a while. I used to talk about this a lot. It was kind of funny. Um, the concept, we all know about a base number, that you've jumped a building, antenna, span, and an earth. You get a base number. Well, well, in the 90s, I used to joke about this a lot with a lot of my friends. Some of you old-time jumpers will remember the chicken base number that you've climbed off of all four objects, climbed off of a building because it wasn't right, and an antenna, and a span, and an earth. Um, and I definitely have a check and base number. I don't know what the number is, but I've, I've climbed off. And again, I think that is something that 
in several incidences that we've seen, even this year and over the last few years, that seemed to play a factor. You get up there to the jump, whether it's complacency or a peer pressure or something that you don't want to jump or you may not feel you want to jump, instead of climbing down, you decide to take that additional risk anyways to make the jump. And of course, it causes either uh, injury or you know death just to not climb down. And that is uh, not necessarily good judgment to do, unfortunately. And consider that on every single jump. There's nothing wrong with climbing down. 285. Dario Zanin. Banana. 285. Dario here. Um, so Dario was on June 8th. And this was uh, Aguila du Midi in Chamonix, France. Impact, again, bad weather conditions with low-level clouds. Um, and, yeah, Etain, yes, we have a pattern here. We keep seeing that bad weather plays a role in a lot of these jumps. There was low visibility, and with that, that's poor judgment. And, sure, it may have cost a good chunk of money. Well, a, what's a good chunk of money to get a tram up and down from uh, the Yigi. I mean, sure, it may cost money, but of course, deciding to make the jump, even though you're putting additional risk, isn't worth that money of that tram ticket. And even though you may have a lot of jumps on a specific exit point, like the Yigi, and taking that complacency, because you think you have enough experience, when we start having weather, a lot of things change. The humidity changes, the temperature changes, the winds are changing. That affects every single bit of your flight that you may not know. It's not the same as the previous jump that you actually had. Ah, Dominic, okay, so Brandon's was his first, first or second terminal jump and at night, but not his first night jump, even though maybe in worse lights it may have been I mean, used. Well, still we have the terminal jump problem. Thank you, Dominic. 286. Here we go. 286. Christopher Labonte. I believe. Again, I'm sorry about any of the pronunciations that I may not have correct. Now, Christopher uh, is an American. This was on June 23rd, and this was in the Dolomites in Italy. And this was an impact flying on terrain. Again, potentially a emergency pull. Now, on this situation, he had climbed up and decided to do a specific jump. And go and he decided to actually uh he had made this jump once before but on this one he decided to take a slightly different path and the problem was this was actually a little later in the afternoon okay so it was not the earlier jump in the morning now uh an important factor in in certain locations like in Italy and the Dolomites is that as we get later in the day there are a lot of other factors to consider like wind and thermals um that are playing a huge role and you know again deciding to make that jump in possibly conditions even if you didn't know directly that at 3 p.m. that there was actually problems, uh, a lot of common knowledge in certain areas is there are certain times of the day you don't, don't want to do these jumps anyway. Find this in Chamonix as well. This could have played a factor where, again, it was really the wrong time of day to make this jump, and he was not getting the same coverage as he did before. And unfortunately, uh, the flight that he thought he was able to make, he was not able to get the same speed as he and distance as he did before, and potentially tried to make a emergency pull. But with that, make an emergency pull, that is, in my opinion, indicative of possibly not having a plan B and a plan C in place. 
he did not have the ability or didn't did not show that he had checkpoints to verify if there was going to be a problem where he might actually decide to make an emer- a, a proper emergency pull. Again, unfortunate situation where planning the weather and knowing the area you're jumping could have made a, a big, big difference uh, in this jump. 287. All right, I knew Michael. Um, Michael Lemming. Now, Michael Lemming, this was on June 25th. This was in the waterfall exit in Chirag. And this was a pin lock malfunction. This is one we talked about earlier that was a gear misconfiguration. Michael was on the exit point, and he realized he had a, he had a bottom pin dislodge as he was about to jump. And, of course, he wanted to fix it really quick. So he did go fix it. But he fixed it incorrectly. He fixed it with too much haste, impatiently. And he apparently did not get a proper gear check. Even if he did, it was not caught that this was an actual issue. There are many images posted on this on the site, uh, on his listing, because this is a major issue that is subtle but it was it's something that you can catch with a proper gear check he actually jumped and did deploy the pilot pilot shoot in time and towed the pilot shoot in because there was no way for it to actually pull any of those pins so this is actually a, a very big problem and again this leads to impatience not complacency but being too impatient Unfortunate is an unfortunate act. Another thing is having that correct gear check. Who cares if you take extra time? If you're going to miss the boat or uh, miss a car ride or something, then maybe you shouldn't be doing the jump at all, anyways. You know, that's, that's my thought on it. Um, uh, make a check that the complete bridle routing is finished packing before gearing up. Absolutely. I mean, but again, if you don't have a friend to do your gear check, you should take twice as long to do your own gear check to make sure it's right. Just because you might actually miss that jump is not a reason to take a shortcut. And this is, uh, this is what happened in this situation. And again, very unfortunate, very sad, because this was... A hundred percent correctable by just taking a few extra seconds to do a proper gear check and not being impatient. Jew bag, right? Number two eighty-eight. Well, I think a lot, a lot of us knew knew Gary Kramer. Um, we uh, we all knew him as Jew bag. June twenty-sixth. Um, this was actually in the Chief in Squamish, British Columbia. This was an impact due to a low pull. Again, uh, this was an unfortunate thing. This was Gary making a jump, and everything was fine with the jump and the exit. And he, he, he uh, basically he was going right to the, the landing zone, and he was following Talus. And the problem is he started flying slowly he was not flying you know really fast but okay so you're not getting a lot of penetration in the wingsuit flying you're doing now uh, i don't know this i don't know this actual uh location but it appears that one of the possibilities is to clear a set of power lines and then do a deploy deploy your parachute if you're getting enough forward penetration well he was Obviously flying slow, that's what was visible uh, in his flight, and he was determined to actually make it past these power lines. He did make it past the power lines and then immediately deployed. The problem is that it was too low. This was a low pull, and this actually allowed him to impact. So, really, uh, again, a... You know, we, we seem to have two patterns here. One pattern is poor weather. The other pattern is a poor choice of 
or having no plan B. There is no reason why an earlier pull and landing somewhere else, even if it's landing in a tree, um, would not have been a more proper choice. Unfortunate. And look, I've I've jumped with uh, I've jumped with Gary many times, and uh, you know I do actually. This is uh, kind of sad because I would have uh, I would have I have always known him to make some Plan B choices, and unfortunately, this is one of those times where it is apparent that he did not. You always have time to pack a pilot chute again. Uh, there with the, the routing stays the same, and you won't suddenly do it differently at each time. Absolutely, Dominic. I, I absolutely you know do that. I use no pack uh, a pilot chute till the exit point. Crater maker, absolutely. Or or secondly, I personally have on an exit point when even I knew that I packed it correctly have decided to repack it to make sure. It only takes a few seconds to repack your pilot chute and again to gear everything up. It does not matter if you are late for the car or you're late for the boat or what. The most important thing is that you're alive. Give my pet. Right. Oh, Ryan, exactly. You know, sometimes also Ryan, to, to that note, you know, about uh, deciding to give a fresh repack, uh, in certain areas, and I do this a lot when, like, say, in Malaysia or very humid locations, I desperately want to repack my pilot chute because with a lot of extra humidity and maybe I'm sweating on the pilot chute, a lot of things could happen. I don't want uh, to have a hesitation in my pilot chute. So, again, there's no reason to make it not to make it fresh so that it's going to open, and it's going to open the way you want it to open. Thanks, everybody, for all the comments. Also, this is great. This is what I was hoping for. <sighs> okay, got to take a minute here for a second. Extremely, extremely unfortunate on this. John Van Horn, JVH, number 289. I'm going to pull this up again. Uh, I think many, many of us knew JVH, and um, this was a very, very sad situation, sad loss for us. Love this guy. Um, JVH was June 29th in Brabant in Chamonix. This was an impact after a stalled exit, uh, basically stalling after exit. Um, not going to go through all of this. There's a lot. There's a very big write-up on the base battalion list for this. In summary, um, basically there was a three-way that the JVH was doing. He was going to be going after, following after everyone else, kind of shadowing them, but was supposed to wait, you know, two seconds or so, maybe a little bit longer. And he actually went well, what was presumed to be maybe a little quick because he did actually encounter the turbulence from the previous two jumpers that had jumped. Now, what he had done at that burble is he went head high instead of having his angle of attack really head low to try to get increased speed. And with that high angle of attack, he decided to initiate a 90 degree turn, which of course in Brabant, you need to start turning and uh, to go into the flight plan that actually caused him and his wingsuit to stall. <sighs> Let's go back to this again. These wingsuits that we're flying, compared to when I started with a, a Birdman Classic uh, back in the mid-90s, are enormous. They generate lots of burble. They can actually stall so much easier than what we had before. And this incident specifically pointed out that, again, JVH did not have uh, maybe he didn't have experience flying burbles. He had not encountered that before. Um, it is definitely obvious that doing a head high angle attack, talking to everybody who does fly these larger suits, that is not the correct procedure to initiate when you're having a problem like this. And of course, uh, with that, I'll go back to this concept. 
it's not really a plan B. The plan B should have should have assumed something like this, like flying into a burble. And uh, this is only one of many jumps, even over the last several years, where whether it's a flying into a burble or stalling a wingsuit has actually caused you know a, a, a impact and or a fatality uh, immediately after the jump. Again, extremely. Uh, extremely sad. You know, I, I love JVH. Uh, I miss him a lot. Uh, this was a, this was actually kind of a big one for me, and I think a lot of people. And I'm sorry to see that. And I, I desperately hope that uh, not just this one, but all of them, we can really learn something from this, from these incidences. Let's go to here. We're going to talk about two nine zero. So two nine zero. Uh, is, I'll call it Jimmy. I don't know how to pronounce his name. He is Serbian. And Jimmy here, Jimmy's incident was on July 1st, and this was in Casale, in Italy. And he actually had a um, lot of parachute jumps, 100 wingsuit jumps. And um, this was a solo jump. And um, he exited solo. He was the last from this uh Casale, which is near Brento in perfect weather, assuming, and that's fine. And what happened is um as he was jumping, <coughs> excuse me, he had decided to actually pull lower and lower and lower. Uh, I guess trying to get, you know, get more distance, right? And get as you're getting more comfortable uh with the jump, which is is something we again kind of do um, as we're trying to go a little bit further. But uh, one thing he's done at this point that is, is, I guess, not gauging as we get further along, he had gone lower and lower and decided, again, not to have the correct judgment as he's getting lower. Um, it could have been a lot of factors, whether it was, again, fatigue or potentially uh, dehydration to be able to not necessarily see the indicators in time, but he had a low pull and again was not able to get anything out in time. I guess one thing is being aware of something, and another thing is having something so dialed that you react correctly when shit hits the fan. Dominic, I specifically want to address this last piece. Um, I think it is my opinion. I feel strongly about this opinion. It is my opinion that that even though a lot of jumpers, it doesn't matter how many jumps they have, they feel like they have things dialed. However, I feel that the technology in the wingsuits today surpasses our human ability of being able to react to things. I believe that we may have things sort of dialed, but when something goes wrong, these wingsuits, and, and for a good degree as well, some of these new powerful tracking suits are, have the ability to react far quicker than we can react. We don't have the reaction to be able to compensate for how fast these wingsuits work. And that, you know, that's indicative of they're, they're easy to fly if everything goes right. They also inflate quickly. We can do these lower and lower jumps. Sure, if everything goes well, they work very well. And the technology has been amazing. But when things go wrong, they react far faster than we as humans can react, even if we have things dialed. There's always this, this speed increase of it. We have to keep that. Uh, into consideration as well. 291. This actually was Tessa Hale. This is a Dutch girl that, um, that made this jump. This was on July 19th. This was an antenna in uh, outside of Amsterdam, or outside of Holland, excuse me, in uh, Afferton. And this was a Again, another rigging error. Now, 
she had a lot of skydives, and she's a tandem master, and she had about 100 base jumps. Okay. But she was also a air traffic controller, and she worked uh, 12-hour shifts, at least, in her job. Now, one thing that I know about this is I was actually called by the police who were doing the investigation, and they actually uh, asked me to assist with this in the knowledge of what's, what's going on, what might have happened, because this was a big problem uh, for the police. The police had never in their lives seen something like this. Um, they had no way of understanding what had happened, and they were uh, quite vexed about the problem and needed help. Here's what I had, uh, had through talking with them, had come up with. First of all, she had just got done working a long shift. Then she only slept for a couple hours. She did still have low experience. It wasn't like she had a lot of base jumping experience. And she did not have a lot of experience with rigging of base rigging. She had a lot of experience with skydiving uh, gear. Now, the problem was that sleep deprivation and possibly fatigue and dehydration because of working so much, and then kind of, you know, compounding that, Again, let me rephrase this again. I keep trying to say this. Dehydration, fatigue, and also sleep deprivation, the first thing that goes is your mental ability to have mechanical reasoning, which, let's face it, rigging is a mechanical reasoning, making sure that your rigging is correct. Well, and also dealing with the malfunctions like line twists or something is also mechanical reasoning. Well, she had at least two things in a serious amount. She definitely had extreme sleep deprivation. Even though she had only a couple hours of sleep, she had been doing this, that is long hours. And fatigue and dehydration meant that when she went to go look at these at her rig and she looked at the gear a couple times and was unable to identify a severe rigging problem. And when she did the jump, Essentially, her bridle was not connected to the, the rig, the container, and she basically went in with a total, even though she pitched. And again, uh, sleep deprivation and dehydration uh, played a significant factor in this. And instead of saying, hey, you know what? I'm kind of tired. Maybe I'll do a jump another time. This is one of those uh, situations where uh, trying to get a chicken base number would have been far better. 292. Cameron Minnie. Now, Cameron Minnie was August 6th, 2016. This was in Miner's Peak in Alberta. This was an impact after exit. This was a wingsuit. Uh, of course, again, now, the one of the big problems with this is, so, uh, the jump occurred Saturday around 4 to 6 p.m. Um, they're not exactly sure of the timing, and it started raining hard about 11 a.m. for about three to four hours, which means it could have been raining up to the time where they've actually made this jump. Now, the winds remained calm, and because it was raining, it definitely was wet. And uh, he was actually doing a solo jump at this point, and um, or yeah, solo jump, sorry. And um, this was actually a reasonably difficult downhill exit from other jumper standpoint, which means you you had to actually be able to get this jump correct, which actually states that if you slipped or fell, you know that's a that's a possible issue. It's been raining, okay? Well, it also, there's a ledge that is something you actually have to clear. Now, with all of those things to consider, um, and also, you know, he didn't have a lot of information or a lot of beacons and doing his solo jump, it sounds like what we can assume from this is it could have possibly been a poor exit, and it's an unforgiving exit point itself. You had to get it right. It was raining previously, at least in that day, so it could have either been mud and or water. And with that stated, 
you know, with also the weather that had just happened, it could have been other types of issues on exit. And of course, he could have even slipped. And then he was found just below the exit point, which means he barely got any, uh, any traction, if any, once he made that exit. Uh, you know, again, uh, I guess I'll go back to this whole concept of uh, doing like a chicken base. Look, I know it's a long way to get out to some of these jumps, but look, uh, it's not really, we really need to make proper judgment. And if you know this is, this is a bad exit point, you know it's been raining, you've just increased all of the odds against you just so you don't have to walk back down and say, I didn't get a jump. I'd rather get my chicken base number uh, on that exit and go make that jump some other time. We have, uh, right, okay, 293. 293 is Gage Gal. August 2nd. This uh, was actually in, uh, in Norway. I don't know how to pronounce this. Uh, this exit point, but this was actually a tracking suit, a tube three. Um, I actually had an opportunity to jump one of these as well. They seem to be a nice, nice suit. Now, this specifically was a borrowed tracking suit. Now, don't get me wrong about the concept of borrowed gear. I have no problem personally with borrowed gear at all. If you understand what the gear is, how it's packed, and how it performs. So he actually had a borrowed jumpsuit, tracking suit, excuse me, and it was noted from other jumpers that were with him that he had been having trouble getting it to fly right. Sure, I mean, you have to get used to a certain suit on how it flies. And he was having problems with this, getting it working. Now, he actually imp impacted, had an impact with this, and... um. Some of the issues, um, he did not try to fly this suit conservatively. I mean, sure, he had a lot of other tracking jumps uh, and also probably big wall jumps, but that doesn't mean you should fly something you're unfamiliar with the same way you fly something you are familiar with. That doesn't work. They don't equate that way. This issue was possibly also gear issue. Look course don't don't know what the suit is uh or don't haven't seen the suit that specific one excuse me i know what a tube three is um maybe there was a, a problem with it where it maybe there's a rip he didn't see maybe there was a real problem with it that he did not identify thus he was not able to get it flying correctly and there is also another possibility that he had a pull issue due to the unfamiliarity with this suit again because he had a no pull this could have been some other kind of factors. Key takeaways from this, well, let's go back to the whole concept. We keep revisiting this a lot, I think. What about a plan B and a plan C and a plan D? And if you're not familiar with a, a site or gear, take a reconnaissance jump. Be conservative. Don't decide to, to jump the way you normally jump when you have all of these other factors going against you. You should actually take a little bit uh, a little bit more caution on that one time. And if you need extra time to pull, then you should be pulling higher so that you'll have time to get that deployment out instead, again, of trying to do what you think you're comfortable with. One thing in base jumping is you must always be willing and able to change what you're doing in the middle of your jump for this plan B, C, D, and however many other alterations you have so that you actually have a safe and successful jump. You must be able to change that. You can't say, I always jump like this, so I'm not going to change the way I jump. Well, that's not the nature of this. We're jumping, base jumping is in the middle of mountains. It's in the middle of weather. And with that, the mountains and weather changes every single second. We have to change with it as well. Now, number 294, Dave Reeder, right? 
Dave Reeder uh, is a Brit. He's an Englishman. And uh, this was actually in Brabant, again, Chamonix, France. And this was in an impact of a cliff strike. And he did have 160 base jumps, and 60 of those were, were wingsuit base jumps. Um, well, let me tell you this. Um, and you, you may flame me for this. 160 base jumps is, not, is nothing. That is not a lot of base jumps. And the fact that really you had only 100 base jumps when you started wingsuit flying is, in my opinion, crazy. But you know what? That's my opinion on this. But it was also interesting that um, this jump was at 4.15 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon, which in Brabant is a serious situation. Things start getting thermic in the mountains. And all the jumpers there know that. And everybody should be telling everybody that. And they should be familiar with, with those types of conditions. This jumper decided to fly another line that he was, it was a, a, a little different. He was not flying as well. He did not have uh, the same altitude he had before. It was late in the afternoon. And instead of having a plan B, C, and D, and, uh, and being able to realize that I'm not where I need to be before I make, uh, before I decide to commit to a very unforgiving line. He actually went, went in anyways into this line where there was no out. There was no way for him to get out and no way to do an emergency pull. He actually, uh, which is actually interesting, he actually impacts uh, as he's crossing a ridge, basically nothing out. And he does not die immediately, but he does have severe brain trauma. One other thing to, to note about this, or really to ask, we don't know what kind of helmet he actually had on uh, or uh, what type of protection it actually was. I would, it would be very important uh, or very useful information to know what that is because everything else didn't have major body injury, but he had brain trauma. This is a possibility that having a better, more proper helmet, uh, or better helmet with a little bit better protection, could have also helped here in this situation. Um, so, unfortunately, some of the takeaways of this, do not fly a committing line in the afternoon, right? You should do that in the morning when it's not thermic. Never operate in the highest margins of your ability and not giving yourself a way out. And just because you made another jump on a, or basically another flight on that same line successfully does not mean that you are going to or, or should even assume that you can do that again when everything changes every single jump, every single day, every single moment, every single second. And additionally, I think we go back to this on wingsuits a lot. Speed is everything. Speed is your friend. If you lose your speed for any reason, then that's really a problem. You'll have problems with your glide. And some of the issues here, again, I'm going to rephrase this in the situation of saying that we see some commonalities. It's 4.15 p.m. in the afternoon, and there had been several jumps made that day. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, several of these jumps, he had done several jumps that day. It is possible that he had fatigue and dehydration actually led, again, to some lack of mechanical reasoning. Look, if we're trying to do jumps, and of course it's August, it's, it's hot there, right? We need to actually keep rehydrating. We need fuel to keep going. We can't just decide to eat once a day. Uh, once in the morning, once in the evening, and assume that our mind is going to keep working correctly. Uh, this could have played a factor in his decision making to go down that line so late in the afternoon. Takeaway, make sure you're eating constantly or being able to refuel yourself so that you can keep your mental aptitude up. Say here, don't fly terrain with south-facing exits in the afternoon. Absolutely. Uh, project base, thank you. So one other thing I would I would mention about this is that as a person who may have information, 
whether you think the person knows something or not, I would always re-mention things like that to people on exit point. Hey, remember, don't fly a South Face and exit in the afternoon. You may already know that, but I just thought I'd be nice and uh, restate it again. Yes, that's another good, uh, good point. Thank you. Catherine Donahue, cat. Again, this is a very interesting one. Um, now, cat, this was on August 11th. This was in Croix de Tetz in France. This was a tracking suit jump, and she impacted. Uh, and uh, she impacted a couple assumptions here. A couple things we, we don't have video of this, but this was a situation where there were three different jumpers being taken to this this exit that they had never jumped before. And uh, I believe there was actually nine or 10, maybe more uh, jumpers on the entire load. There were a lot of people there. And uh, Kat was the last person to actually jump. Uh, the, the conditions were not terribly bad, although the flight plan was specifically in a shadow. And I've talked to a lot of people who have actually jumped this flight before. And this launch, in order to clear both of these, these notches, need to have, or the dumper needs to have a immediate track as soon as they're leaving the exit point in order to clear that. And you need to have a decent track to be able to do that. So you have to be ready to, to get to those next exit points. I'm unclear if the people who were taking these, was taking cat there, actually explain some of those pieces or some of the checkpoints to her as far as plan B and plan C. But what was very clear is that it was clear that on her jump, the visible part of her jump, when she first left, she was very, uh, very head low, very steep in exit for seven to eight six seconds. And then, of course, she disappeared be be behind a ridge line, which is where she would have continued her track and continued to try to track or out track these two notches. And that never happened. Now, according to finding her or finding her, um, uh, her body and trying to do an inspection on what may have happened. First of all, the facts are she did do a steep launch in an, in a launch or in a site that required immediate uh, immediate direction to to be able to clear if they wanted to out track both of the uh, both of these notches. You can't you can't make it there if you're not getting your track on fairly quickly. Next, uh, even though the hike was was not uh, like fast pace or hardcore, that does not mean that fatigue and dehydration did not play a role. It was a two-hour hike. I don't know how much water uh, and or food was taken for that time period, but I do know we're talking about uh, we're talking about August 11th, early aug, early to mid August, still warm, and the body still sweats, right? Even if you're not having visible sweat off your body, you still are starting to dehydrate if you don't continue to drink water. That could have played a role. And it does appear that by not having, Kat did not have a plan B or plan C in order to identify when she should identify, know when she's not going to clear a notch. And uh, according to, the rescuers, she it looks like she impacted the first notch and was and fell down to the second one, which means she thought she could continue to make that notch and continue to out track that whole situation before uh, she realized she didn't. So with her continuing to try to out track that, with seeing the photos of the area that time of day, right? Because there's a specific shadow that time of day. It appears to me that lighting could have played a factor in being able to identify checker po checkpoints as far as when you want to decide to say you're not going to make it. Two, 
uh, not actually having that proper understanding of where I need to decide that I know I'm not going to make something. And then three, this is her first jump on that exit. She does not know the exit. So if when all else fails, if you don't understand the checkpoints or you really can't identify them, whether it's because you're in a shadow or whatnot, this is something that a reconnaissance jump being more cautious would have helped and assist with. You don't have to make the first jump that you're doing uh, uh, a, a jump like everybody else did. Right? Just because everybody else made it past that notch, and if there was 10 people that made it before her, or however many there were, does not mean you can also make it. Right? You have to go with your abilities. You have to assess if you're flying right. And unfortunately, that did not occur in this, in this situation, in this instance. She was going to be doing exactly what everybody else did to try to make it past. Good way to refuel raw honey, absolutely attain. Um, yes, I mean, when we really think about this, uh, if anybody has ever gone to the gym and tried to go to uh, a, a elliptical machine or Stairmaster or any of these computerized machines that will watch your activity, I mean, we're actually, as humans, doing even doing a hike, we're burning somewhere between maybe 400 and sometimes 1,000 calories an hour, depending upon our activity. Well, if we're burning that many calories and we're not putting more calories in, you're actually becoming fatigued, period. You just are. That is, uh, that is just known. One thing I think I point out, I've tried to point this out before, is that uh, when we think of, if you think of athletes like, let's say, a bike, a a professional bike rider for, let's say, the Tour de France or an Olympic athlete, they all understand how you're burning calories and also how you're dehydrating. And they have very regimented ways of refueling. Base jumping, in my opinion, is just as important or just as strenuous and as critical as anything like the Tour de France or uh, severe they are serious mountain climbing or an Olympic athlete. And we have to take that in consideration and we have to treat it that way. Uh, use caution flying terrain in the afternoon. Absolutely. Uh, project base. Yeah. One thing about this for cat's jump specifically, this line was in the shadow in the afternoon. And that is, uh, that's also a problem. If you're jumping and you're tracking and you're in a shadow, I mean, again, coming from a sunny, sunny area when you first launched, going into the shadow later to try to have visual cues, your eyes are going to take a little bit of time to adjust, and you're not exactly going to see everything correctly. And again, you should use that extra caution if you're not able to see anything. I'd rather pull and knowing I can't see anything than decide to uh, continue to go and clear something when I'm not 100% clear if I can clear it specifically because I may not be able to see it. Right. So here's what I was uh, planning to do today, guys. Um, uh, turn this on again. And again, I'll talk this uh, at the very end here, right? Um, I want to thank everybody for the time. You know, we had 37 incidences that we had in 2016. We're not going to have enough time to go through all of them today. Uh, I am going to break this up into two sessions. This is going to be the first one. And we're going to have a second session as well. We're going to go through the next ones. This is uh, something I wanted to do was try to get everybody to have comments, feedback. Looks like we've done a lot of that. Uh, so the discussion's open to talk about the problems, these problems and problem spaces and ways to correct it, to actually identify this. So I want to thank everybody for their time and attention to this. Uh, I want to thank a lot of people for uh, putting together a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, details for this. Let me actually go through this real quick. I'm going to put something here, right? A uh, couple things I want to thank. You know, I'm the producer of this. I'm I'm running the basis of this and, and uh, Blink Magazine. But I really want to thank uh, Pato and Kenny. Uh, Pato specifically for helping to work with and um, 
gathering information, gra- gathering images uh, for the fatalities and the stats. Um, couldn't do it without Pato. Couldn't do it without his help. Uh, and I also appreciate everybody else's time and help when we're trying to gather information and record this information so we can learn from it. Remember, this is a learning experience. And if we cannot learn from our mistakes, we are doomed to repeat them. That is just fact. That's just going to be history for us. And we don't want to do that. We want to learn from this. And yes, very welcome, Attain. Last thing, you know, I want to remind everybody, uh, look, uh, be safe in 2017. Uh, Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, There's the Mick Knutson one. I forgot to put the other uh, Blinken Magazine one I'm trying to focus on. And for those who are base jumpers, there is actually a base fatality list Facebook group. And uh, the link is actually on this uh, this original invite. If uh, you are a base jumper and you want to uh, have a technical discussion on some of these fatalities and also as new ones come about, we can get notified about them and try to uh, try to address the issues. Again, getting the information out there and learning from it. Uh, please join our Facebook group as well, or try to do that. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you on a exit point soon. Everybody, you're you are very very welcome. And like I said, this is session one. I'll see everybody again in session two. Thanks a lot.